Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Julia He, a tobacco researcher at Ohio State University. TOPS is organized by Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University, Si Shang from Ohio State University, and Catherine McLean from Temple University. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded. The presentation slides will be made available on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Si Shang, from Ohio State University to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Today, we continue our spring 2022 season with a single paper presentation by Erica Montanga entitled The Effect of Vertical Identification Card Laws on Used Tobacco Use. This presentation was selected via a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Erica Montenga is a PhD candidate in economic studying at Georgia State University. She is particularly interested in health economics with a focus on tobacco research and applied microeconomics. She previously received an economics and statistics degree and a master's degree in economics from the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Dr. Michael Pesco from Georgia State University is a co-author of the study and will answer select Q&As. Our discussion today is Dr. Justin White. Erica, thank you for presenting for us today. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, and in this talk today, I'm going to present a paper titled The Effect of Vertical Identification Card Laws on Used Tobacco Use. Uh, and this paper is co-authored with Michael Pesco, who is an associate professor at Georgia State University. Uh, in terms of disclosures, I'm a graduate student and I do not have any history of current, any history or current funding from either the government or the industry. The view expressed in this paper are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the view of the author's institution and they're not in a conflict of interest to declare. So to give you a brief preview of this paper, in this paper, we are mainly focusing on the vertical ID card laws and the major feature change in these card laws is that there was a change in the orientation of the IDs uh, from horizontal to vertical for those individuals below the age of 21. And hence, at the point of sale of tobacco and alcohol, it can be easy for sellers to identify individuals below the age of 21 from those above the age of 21. So in this paper, we are trying to address or we're trying to answer whether and how do these vertical ID card laws affect youth tobacco and alcohol use in the United States. We use a data set from pooled national and state youth risk behavior surveillance system. We also use national youth tobacco survey and tobacco use supplement to current population survey. Uh, there was variation in the timing of adoption of these vertical ID laws across the states. And therefore we take advantage of these variation and estimate a difference in difference model where we estimate two-way fixed effect model and um, a novel stack difference in difference model, where this model takes into account the staggered nature of uh, implementation of our policy of interest. In general, we do not find evidence that these laws had reduced underage tobacco and alcohol use. 
However, these results remain to be important in terms of policy. First, because uh, there was a previous study that ended in 2009 that documented that uh, vertical IB laws reduce underage smoking, especially among the 16 year olds. So we are complementing this study by providing an extension with extra years of data in the analysis. And we see that the effectiveness of these vertical ID laws had reduced over the years. And also these findings are important given that um, these vertical ID laws and the change in the orientation of the ID is a major feature that has been implemented across all the states in the US. Uh, just to refresh on how big of a public health concern tobacco is, uh, tobacco use is considered among the leading cause of preventable diseases, uh, disability and death in the United States, where it's estimated that the cost associated with smoking in terms of both direct healthcare costs and losses in productivity are over 289 billion. And uh, addressing underage tobacco and alcohol use is important since it's also been documented that uh, there is correlation, which is strong between teen smoking and smoking later in life. So any policies that aim to address underage smoking could also have a positive impact in adult population, where it's been documented that nine out of 10 adults who smoke cigarette daily started smoking before the age of 18. So vertical ID are among policies that targeted underage identification at the point of sale, where this law started being implemented in 1990s, and Colorado was the first state to implement this law in 1994. Other states such as Delaware followed in 1996, and most states implemented after 2000. And by 2018, all the state had this law in place. So the major feature change uh, that has happened was that there was a change in the way the IDs were presented from horizontal to vertical. And these two pictures here provide like a preview example on how that happened. So before the law was implemented, all the IDs in the states would have uh, a horizontal orientation. For example, this ID on my right, regardless of the age. But after the implementation of the law, they change the orientation to vertical to this ID on my left. So just by looking at the orientation of these IDs, a person can easily differentiate whether an individual is above or below the age of 21. So a person may wonder like uh, what percentage of um, teens could hold licenses and uh, from previous surveys, we see that 41% of teens were licensed before the age of 16 and 60% before the age of 18. Uh, in addition, this law also extended to other forms of IDs, including state IDs. There are a number of mechanisms through which we think that vertical ID law could affect or reduce uh, underage tobacco and alcohol use, such as it can save time. For example, a person can simply look at the orientation and figure out whether to sell or not to sell tobacco and alcohol to an individual. It, it can also reduce retailers human error instead of like calculating by looking at date of birth, then a person can simply like look at the orientation of the IDs. And it can also reduce manipulation of age information by teens. However, it's not guaranteed that this law could necessarily lead to lower underage tobacco and alcohol consumption, uh, mostly because in some cases, retailers could ignore maybe looking at the IDs or teen could access fake IDs and use fake IDs instead of their actual vertical oriented IDs. Or they could use legal IDs of somebody who is older than them. Uh, in other cases, teen could also obtain these products through legal of age straw purchases. Uh, another motivation of looking at this policy is that there have been recent studies that have documented uh, the increase of minimum legal uh, age of sale of tobacco to 21 had also impacted younger teens uh, smoking behavior uh, in, and also had increased perceived risk of cigarette use among younger teens as well. 
So this observed reduction in younger teens smoking behavior, we are wondering whether this effect could be driven also by the presence of vertical ID laws that were implemented before the Tobacco 21 law. Uh, we're not the first study to look at this uh, uh, law change. Uh, the pioneers who looked at this law was done in like 2013. And in this study, they have a, a very nice setup where they motivated uh, potential channels through which the vertical ID law could affect teen smoke and drinking behavior. And we borrow a lot from them in, in terms of how we approach estimation of our impact of these laws. And this study uh, uses the national wire BSS data set and two-way fixed effect model. And they document that uh, this ID had reduced its chances that a 16-year-old could smoke or drink. But they also note that the effects were not long lived. In an even study kind of setting, they observed that mostly these effects were concentrated within one to two years after the state started uh, issuing the vertical IDs. And similar effects were not observed amongst older teens. Uh, in a different study, uh, Nelson and Sharta looked at how these vertical IDs could affect uh, traffic fatalities that involve alcohol impaired minors, and they do not find any impact of these uh, vertical ID laws. But I must say, uh, this study might not like necessarily mean that vertical ID law did not have any impact on alcohol since um, traffic fatalities that involve alcohol could be associated mostly with a heavy or frequent use of alcohol. And therefore, maybe vertical ID's law could still reduce um, current or less frequent use of alcohol. So we make several contributions to this literature. First, we add extra years of data in the analysis. The previous study had ended in 2009. So, and a lot has changed in terms of like the market, in terms of uh, new products in the market, including e-cigarettes. So we extend this by including more years of data from 2009 to 2019. And we also extend this by considering uh, state and national wire BSS to get a pooled sample, which increased the number of observations. And we also uh, do same analysis using different two other different data sets, including NYTS data set, and tobacco use supplement to current population survey data set. And we also look at different uh, tobacco and alcohol use outcomes that were not explored in the previous studies, including cigar uh, smoking. And also we take advantage of the question on how many days in the past 30 days a person used tobacco or alcohol. So we use that to explore whether there are any effects of this policy on like different usage rate of tobacco and alcohol. And we also use a uh, different approach. We use a stark difference in difference approach to account for the fact that there was staggered adoption of these vertical ID laws in different states. So I'll pause here for now to check if there are any questions. Thank you very much, Erica. So we can turn to our discussion today, Dr. Justin White, to see whether he has any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Maybe just one clarifying question at this point. Uh, so it seems like one factor that would affect whether these vertical ID laws are effective or not would be whether retailers are checking IDs, you know, complying with the law. And I'm, I'm curious if you're aware of any literature that sort of looked at either secret shoppers or other things to, to get a sense of whether um, retailers are, do actually check IDs consistently. Uh, I think there are some studies that looked at that, but in this particular study, we did not look at that yet. Uh, maybe one way we are thinking is like, we, if we can get data set on like the rate at which different states, uh, the rate at which retailers in different states check IDs, that could be one of like useful avenue to look at on whether like there is variation across states depending on how frequent or retailers check IDs in different states. So, yeah. but for now we haven't done that yet. Okay, thanks.
Thank you. Uh, we don't see any Q&As, so Erica, uh, you can continue the presentation. Thanks. Okay. Uh, in terms of data, as mentioned earlier, we use, for the main analysis, we use pooled national and state youth risk behavioral surveillance system uh, for the years 1991 to 2019. The national YRBSS is administered by CDC and the state YRBSS is administered by health or education departments in collaboration with the CDC. And this surveys high school students in pri private and public schools in the United States and is being conducted every two years. So with this data set, the main outcome we're interested at in are cigarette smoking and alcohol use, where we categorize this into four main categories, depending on how many days over the past 30 days that a person either smoked or drank alcohol. So we have any current uh, use, we have casual or more use, we have frequent use and daily use. Other outcomes we explore are cigarette smoking and smokeless tobacco use. Again, we categorize this into four categories, depending on the number of days the person smoked over the past 30 days. We did not include e-cigarette vaping in the analysis. And this is mainly because the question regarding e-cigarette vaping was introduced in YRBSS in 2015. And by that time in 2015, all the state had vertical B laws in place except three states. So we did not have enough variation in the data set to explore this question. Uh, for analytical purposes, uh, for tobacco use, we mainly focus on 16 and 17 year olds. And this is mainly because uh, over the study period that we're looking at, most states had minimum legal cell age of 18 or 19. And another reason is that in YRBSS data set, the 18 year olds are top coded. So there is no way to differentiate between 18 year olds and individuals a little above 18 year olds. For alcohol use, uh, we do analysis for 16, 17, and 18 year olds. So in this graph here, we show the prevalence of uh, cigarette and alcohol and cigar and smokeless tobacco use for the sample we used in the analysis over the study period, where in terms of cigarette smoking for most years, after 1997, the rate of prevalence of cigarette smoking has been declining to around 5.9% in 2019. Uh, for alcohol use, there's also a steady decline to 30% in 2019, but still these rates are relatively high. Uh, for supplemental analysis, we use a uh, National Youth Tobacco Survey dataset and Tobacco Use Supplement to Current Population Survey. Uh, the National Youth Tobacco Survey we use for the periods of 2000 to 2017, and this provide a uh, national representative dataset for middle and high school students in the United States. Again, we focus on 16 and 17 year olds, and we use this dataset to evaluate cigarette smoking outcome. Uh, for tobacco use supplement to current population survey, we'll look at this for the period of 1992 to 2015. Uh, and this is being conducted as part of USA uh, Census Bureau current population survey. Again, we focus on 16 and 17 year olds, but uh, because of the way the question was set in this survey, we mainly look at current and daily cigarette smoking. Uh, this graph here shows the number of states that had vertical ID laws in place. So the data on vertical ID laws came from the two previous studies and also for the remaining states that had adapted later, about five states, we get the data through original research. So as I mentioned earlier, most states adapted after 2000 and by 2018, all the states had the vertical ID uh, implemented. So there are various like challenges when we looked at this question on how vertical ID law 
um, could affect underage tobacco and alcohol use. So one of the challenges is that there was no information in the survey about the date of birth of individuals. So there was no way of knowing exact when they turned 16 in the data set uh, or when they turned their respective age in the data set. And also for majority of the states that had adopted this law previous in earlier years, there was no information on the exact effective month that the state started issuing the vertical IDs. So that brings a challenge on like assigning vertical IDs, especially on the effective year of vertical ID to teens. Uh, and another challenge is that the teens that already had horizontal IDs were not required by the law to go back and change them to vertical IDs. That's only newly issued license were vertical. So to go around these challenges, we use simplifying assumptions that were used in the previous study. And we assume that 16 year old on the effective year were all treated and 17 year old one year after were treated and 18 year old two years after the state passed the law were treated and onward. So for example, if a state X had implemented this law in 2010, so we assume that 16 year olds on 2010 and onward were treated, 17 year old on 2011 and onward had vertical IDs and 18 year old two years after from 2012 and onward had vertical IDs. We also control for other uh, policies, all the policies that were controlled in Bello and Bat study, and we included other policies to account for changes in laws or policies that had taken place in more recent years. Uh, so our method, again, exploit that there is a uh, variation in the timing at which these vertical laws were implemented across different states. And therefore, we exploit a difference in different uh, estimation strategy. Well, with this estimation strategy, the key is to have a treatment group. Uh, for our case, this will be the state where vertical ID laws were implemented. And the control group, this will be the state where there was no implementation of vertical ID law. Uh, around the effective date of the treated state. And it also requires for each of these treated treatment group and control group to have a pre-period and a post-period. So one challenge that has been documented in the recent literature on uh, difference in difference is that when you have a standard policy design, then there's a possibility for treated units to return back as potential control for later treated units. And if there is time varying treatment, if that this could be problematic, and two-way effect estimation could result in an estimation error. So to address this, we use a stack difference in difference model where for this kind of model, only control states that were untreated can return as potential con uh, counterfactual for the treated states. And since all the states adapt at some point, as I mentioned earlier, by 2018, all the states had this vertical ID law in place. We allow states to return as potential control as long as they did not adapt this policy four years before or four years after the treated state. So to estimate this, we reconstruct our data set where first we identify the vertical ID law event, which for example, it can be for Colorado vertical ID law event is 1994 because that's when they implemented the law. Then we select controls for each vertical ID law event where control states, this will be the states where they did not implement the vertical ID law four years before the effective date, which is in the vertical ID law event and four years after uh, the effective date. So then for each of these uh, vertical ID law event and the control states, they make up a stack. So we have different stacks for different vertical ID law event, then we append these stacks to make one data set. And we do this for each age group because as I mentioned earlier, we make a simplifying assumption that 16 year olds are treated on the effective year, 17 year olds are treated one year after, and 18 year olds are treated two years after. 
So there is variation in the vertical ID law event across age group. That's why we are repeating these steps for each age group. Uh, then we estimate our stack difference in difference estimation for each age group again, where Y uh, in this equation is our outcome of interest, tobacco, alcohol use. Uh, then vertical ID is our main uh, variable of interest, which is uh, an indicator which takes the value of one if the state implemented this law uh, in this time period T. And we control for individual characteristics such as race, gender, and grade level. And we control for a number of policies, including tobacco control policies such as cigarette taxes, e-cigarette taxes, cigar taxes, minimum legal uh, cell age, um, indoor vaping restrictions, indoor smoking restrictions. And we also control for alcohol policies, for example, such as um, beer taxes, liquor taxes, zero tolerance law, uh, ID requirement law. And we also control for recreation and medical marijuana laws and economic climate variables, including unemployment rate and uh, real uh, median household income. We also control for state fixed effect, year fixed effect, and stock fixed effect. And we cluster our robust standard error at state level. Then we also estimate an event study to understand how the dynamic of the effect over time after the law was implemented, where all the variables retain the same definition as previous equation, but here the variable that changed definition is vertical ID which now represent uh, indicators for the years before, during, and after the state implemented the vertical ID law. And uh, J indexes the relative time period to the state implementation of vertical ID law, where we uh, exclude one year prior and we treat it as omitted category. Uh, I'll pause here again to check if there are any questions. Thank you, Arika. Justin, do you have any questions? Yeah, um, thank you. So when I was just preparing for today, I noticed that some states do issue restricted driver's license to um, uh, youth who are age 15 or potentially even 14 in one or two states. And I'm wondering if you, I don't actually know how it works, but like when they turn 16, do they have to get another license? But it seems like some of them might have ended up with vertical license, sorry, horizontal licenses. And so then if you're using sort of the, if that happens, uh, if you're using sort of the, the, the year of the law when that goes into effect, then those people would have had, that would have sort of like reduced the pool of, of people who might have received vertical licenses. And I'm curious if that's something that you have thought about controlling for, or mm -hmm. if that seems relevant to you to control for um, th those sorts of uh, laws. Some, some of it would be picked up by state fixed effects, I suppose, if it's not changing over time, but uh, you know, it, it's possible that these sorts of age cutoffs could also be changing um, over time too. Uh, so the first thing is that first, we're, we're doing this estimation by age group. So one potential way of like extending to 15 year old is like uh, doing another, uh, running another regression with 15 year olds. So again, uh, in terms of like licenses, um, so there's this program called Graduated Driving License Program, which again, we control for an indicator on whether the state has that program or not as uh, one of the policies. And in this program, uh, depending, it varies across the state, like the minimum age varies across like different states. And the main thing is that uh, some states have like minimum age of 15 or 14, but that's not the case for all the states depending on like which state we are looking at. And they have three main stages where the first is like, uh, they're being given instructional permit, which this is like restricted driving. And mainly this instruction permit is for 15 year olds. Then they graduate to the second stage where they get provisional license, mostly 16 and 17 year olds. And then after that, they get like another more full license with maybe some restriction on the number of passengers that they allow in the car. 
So given this, we do not look at 15 or 14 year olds in the analysis because we uh, we aren't sure like on how on the proportion or fraction of them that will hold the uh, vertical IDs at the time they turn 15 or 14. So we have not done that yet. But yeah, I think that um, we can explore that and imagine and see whether. We yeah, just, just to be clear, I, I wasn't suggesting that you look at 15 year olds. I was just thinking that when those, uh, if they got it at 15, then when they turn 16 and enter your sample, they, mm -hmm. they, would, they would already have a horizontal ID. So it wouldn't be necessarily eligible for the, uh, or wouldn't need to get the vertical ID. But it sounds like if you're already adjusting for this policy, you've sort of got it covered. Um, so just to switch to something else. So um, if I could talk a little bit about your stacks DD um, strategy. Um, so one advantage it seems like of the stack difference and differences over a two-way fixed effects is that it avoids comparing each treated unit to already treated states um, mm -hmm. because uh, you know being treated might put them on a different trajectory. But it seems like you are actually sort of putting those already treated states back into your pool of controls. Uh, if they haven't implemented recently. And it seems like that could potentially undo th that advantage of stack difference and differences and con contaminate your estimates. And so I'm wondering if you've also run specifications that don't put those states back in, because it seems like that would be more truer to what the purpose of a stacked DD is designed to do. Oh yeah, so maybe uh, it did not come out very clear, but the thing is that we are not including back the previously treated states completely. So I, I thought you said that uh, if they hadn't implemented, if they implemented a while ago, then you put them back in. Is that mm, not true? No. Maybe I misunderstood. Uh, so we don't we don't put them back again in the stacks if they had implemented a while ago. We just make sure that they had not implemented completely over the nine year window. Even if it's before the nine year window, like they ha do not have that policy in place completely. I see, okay, I misunderstood. Okay, that, that, that's great. Um, maybe one last question would be just, um, have you also looked at how, um, uh, how, how the youth are uh, obtaining alcohol and tobacco, sort of like what the source is and whether that's changing over time? Because it seems like that could be important for understanding mechanisms. Yeah, so, we haven't like fared the analysis with the sources, but I know for sure like YRBSS data has some question regarding whether they get, where they get the, their products. And I think like majority get their product from social sources with like the recent, with the surveys, that's what they mentioned, but we haven't explored the mechanism uh, uh, yet to know like, uh, to know whether this vertical ID law changed uh, the way, like the, their behavior regarding like where they get their tobacco and alcohol products. Okay, but yeah, that, I know that. That is something I guess worth looking at so as to understand more on why we do not see the impact of these laws on tobacco and alcohol use. Okay, nothing else for me right now, thanks. Yeah, so there is a question from um, the audience um, and there's a question about would be uh, would the would the implementation of these laws be impacted by the increased difficulty some communities face in getting state IDs? For example, communities with no easy transport to DMV. Mm. Uh, I think potentially, but we do not. We are yet to like have the data to look at that. But of course, maybe we can think about that. Like. If uh, if an area has more easy access to these IDs, then potentially uh, the rate or intensity of treatment could be different across different areas, depending on how easily they access the IDs. But yeah, we haven't explored that yet. But thank you. I think that is also another good avenue to look at on whether maybe we can be able to observe an effect depending on uh, the intensity at which a certain subgroup is being treated by this policy. Thank you. Actually, I have a question regarding your controls. You know, you study period uh, spans um, almost like three decades, right, since the uh, 1990s. And we know that during that period, there were a lot of actions um, 
trying to uh, curb the use tobacco use and alcohol use. Um, and we, we saw a lot of state and local level actions. So I'm wondering how well you state level policy controls capture the actions at a local level. And related, I think since you are looking at the young population, the school level policies also matter. So can you also discuss about whether your uh, regressions control for school policies? Uh, for now, we do not control for school policies, but uh, in one like of my 10 papers, I looked at uh, school policies such as um, campus smoking policy, but I did not find any impact of that on tobacco use, at least for that context. But for this, I did not include uh, school level kind of policies in the analysis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How about local policies? Did you uh, wait to the local policies and include it in the control or no? The county level, for example, county level and city policies. We have some in terms of like our indoor smoking restrictions and uh, parking restrictions at county level. But yeah, for other variables, for other policies, we consider the state level policies. Thank you, thanks. Uh, I don't see any other questions from the audience. Uh, so you can continue with the presentation. Thank you very much. So um, for the next uh, slide, I'm going to discuss the results and mainly I'm going to focus on the event study results and I'm going to just show a few out of uh, other results that we have. Uh, so in this uh, event study results, the, we have two uh, colors. We have dark blue that represent coefficient estimate from stat difference to difference. And we have light blue to represent coefficient estimate from two-way fixed effect uh, model. And uh, the horizontal axis represent years relative to states implementation of this vertical ID law. Uh, where we looked at uh, years before and years after. So I must note that like for the two-way fixed effect model, we control for an additional lag of five years or more after the implementation of the law, but uh, we do not put the results in this uh, event study. So uh, the main thing, the main takeaway is here is that the coefficient estimate on the years before the implementation of vertical ID laws are not statistically different from zero, impl implying that uh, our estimation meets the prior trend assumption that is, uh, if, with, um, if the vertical ID law was not implemented, then treated and controlled states will have similar uh, casual plus cigarette smoking, for example. So if we see any changes after the vertical ID law implementation, then we can associate those change with uh, the implementation of vertical ID law. So in this graph, we, we present uh, the coefficient estimate after of the similar graph before. So here we see that uh, all the coefficient estimates are not significantly different from zero implying that uh, for this context in this age group of 16 year old, uh, and for this outcome of casual or more smoking, uh, we do not see any impact of vertical ID law on the underage uh, tobacco or smoking uh, for 16 year olds. So after this, I'm going to present the full set of results for 16 year olds for the four categories where we have any current smoking, we have casual plus smoking, frequent smoking and daily smoking. Uh, and again, looking at these results, the prior trend assumption has been like met for most of um, outcomes. And when we look at the coefficient estimate before the red line, which will be the coefficient estimate before the states implemented the vertical ID law are not different from zero, but the coefficient estimate also after are not different from zero, 
indicating that the law had no any or did not reduce underage uh, tobacco use for the sample of 16 year olds. Uh, for frequent smoking, uh, we see there is a bit of slight upward trend, but also the coefficient estimate are not different from zero. Uh, for daily smoking, we also see a slight upward trend, but again, all this estimate for stark difference in difference model, which is our main like uh, preferred uh, specification, they're all not uh, significant. Uh, then, then this is the results of the event study for alcohol use outcome uh, for 16 year olds. And again, we present the four figures for any current use, casual or more use, frequent or more use and daily use. And most of these outcomes, all of these outcomes, the coefficient estimate before are not different from zero and also afterward are not different from zero, indicating that uh, in this outcome, uh, vertical ID law did not reduce uh, any current or any use of alcohol among the 16 year olds. Uh, this figure represents the results for 18 year olds. And again, we present the four figures for the four categories of alcohol use. Again, we do not find any uh, reduction in alcohol use for the sample of 18 year olds. And prior trend uh, has been made like for most of these outcomes, except for frequent or more use, um, indicating that also for alcohol use, uh, the vertical ID law did not uh, lead to reduction in alcohol consumption in the sample of 18 year olds. Uh, we did some, oh, in terms of other results, we get uh, qualitatively similar results when we use different age groups and different data sets. We find that vertical ID law do not significantly lower probability that teens smoke for 16 and 17 year olds in national and state YRBSS. And also we thought like maybe this could be driven by one data set. So we looked at uh, by running the same regression in a different data set. And we find that there was also similar results where vertical ID law did not reduce smoking uh, for 16 and 17 year olds in NYTSS and also in tobacco use supplement to current population survey data set. In terms of alcohol, also we did not find that vertical ID laws reduce uh, alcohol use for 16, 17, and 18 year old in our BSS data set. And we find also similar results with other tobacco outcomes, including cigar smoking and smokeless tobacco use. And just to note, uh, we precisely estimate this zero effect for most of outcomes, uh, except for less common outcomes such as to smokeless tobacco. In terms of robustness test, uh, we carried a number of them. So one of them is we replicated the previous study and find similar results as the previous study that uh, vertical ID law reduced 16 year old uh, cigarette smoking for the period of 1991 to 2009. When we extended it to 2019, we found that the effectiveness of vertical ID laws in reducing uh, underage tobacco and alcohol use was lower compared to uh, the period of 1991 to 2009. We also, as I showed the results in the event study estimations, we estimated it to a fixed effect model. We included state specific time trend to account maybe if there is any uh, variation in time varying factors across states that affect underage tobacco and alcohol use. And we also used weights in the analysis to just check whether the results remained the same. And we did also some robustness check regarding the individual's uh, day of birth within that particular calendar year. And mostly this involved because we had make an assumption previously that 16 year olds were treated from the year of where the state implemented uh, the law but here we carry robustness check by 
maybe assuming they are treated one year after instead of that particular year or oh, another robustness check we did was just like dropping all the 16 year old observations in the year that the state passed the law and all this led to similar findings that we do not find that vertical id law reduced uh, underage tobacco and alcohol use So overall, we do not find uh, an imp any impact of vertical ID law on youth, tobacco use, and alcohol use. And this effect seemed to have reduced over the past uh, decade, which could reflect a number of things, including like changes in the marketplace for tobacco products, including the entry of new products such as e-cigarette. And we are still exploring this, and we're still like trying to figure out like what has happened over the last one decade that made vertical ID laws no longer effective in reducing uh, youth tobacco use. Uh, another potential limitation that could uh, reduce the effectiveness of vertical ID law could be uh, their enforcement was not well, as I mentioned earlier, maybe retailers could ignore checking their IDs or the presence of alternative sources of tobacco, especially the social sources, such as maybe a network of friends who are older, who maybe could provide uh, a means through which underage team could access this product. Uh, in this study, we are focused only on vertical ID laws, because again, we think that it's a major feature that has been uh, adapted by all the states, but we are hoping and planning like in future to explore other ID laws and other features in ID to understand whether they have an impact and the magnitude of the impact they have on underage uh, tobacco and alcohol use. So thank you. I will see if there are any questions. Thank you, Arika. That was fantastic. Uh, Justin, do you have any questions for Arika? Sure, uh, re really nice job. Um, this, this is a great paper, um, or it will be a great paper when it's released. Um, so I have, I, on the last slide actually, you, you posed the question of sort of like what happened in the last decade. And I think that that's really sort of like one of the conundrums, you know, what, what's going on here. And I'm just curious if, if, um, uh, if you have thoughts about what, what's driving sort of the difference in your results from the earlier results by, um, blue and bot. So we are still trying to like think through it and to like uh, look at maybe changes in the marketplace that could have driven the reduction in the effectiveness of these laws. So one thing could be maybe uh, the introduction of new products. We are still thinking like how could that affect these policies? And also maybe if after the implementation of these laws, if maybe um, individuals or the market of fake, black market maybe of fake IDs, how does that change? How does that, how long does, do they take to like, um, to start issuing these like fake maybe horizontal vertical IDs? So we are still exploring to understand what exactly led to the reduction of the effectiveness of vertical IDs. And yeah, and we welcome like if any person has thoughts or suggestions on how possibly could have changed and could have led to like different results from these more recent years compared to the previous years. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I have any great ideas, but one thing that I think is notable that you showed earlier is, is just the secular decline in both alcohol use and tobacco use in uh, the, like the last, that, that decade that you added on to mm -hmm. um, the earlier paper. And I, you know, so, if there's if there's not you know variation in that decline uh, across states, that's not a problem. But if there is, then it seems like that still could be uh, potentially a sort of threat to validity, it, especially you know if the state specific linear time trends aren't totally taking care of that. Um, and so uh, anyway, I, I don't know that there's much more you could do in that regard. I mean, I suppose you could think about like quadratic trends or other things, but um, it, it does seem like that, that that's sort of like one, one thing that has notably changed more recently. Um, so I, let's take your main findings that these vertical ideas, IDs are not effective. 
Um, and so do you think they are still worth having, um, even if they don't affect uh, alcohol and tobacco use because they sort of uh, save, might save time or hassle for retailers or other reasons? Like, do you, do you, do you, what do you sort of conclude from, um, from this? Yeah, I think this, even though they don't have uh, an impact, I think we, um, I think they are still worth having because they come with like, first, I think they are cost effective ways of like simply, you just print the IDs differently and that can signal the age of a person. So I think that's still worth having. And also I mentioned like other benefits, like it saves time for the retailers so that maybe it could be an incentive for a person to ask for an ID because they don't have to do all the math in their head. And also um, there are other features, I think, apart just from being vertical that are yet to be explored and like to understand how these different features factor in and whether they have any impact. So yeah, so that's, I think the conclusion we have for now in terms of like how important should these vertical IDs be in the current scenario. Um, See, so you're, you're welcome to take the question from Chad. Now. Good. So there is a question, question from Mike Cummings. So if one were interested in finding ways to prevent sales of tobacco and alcohol to underage persons, what does the literature suggest will work? And he also mentioned some e-cigarette manufacturers have proposed software to promote ID checking and prevent bulk purchasing to limit secondary sources of e-liquids. And New Zealand is, um, has proposed limiting the number of retail outlets permitted to sell the products. So what does the evidence shows works? So basically what evidence uh, there, there is in the literature that shows working uh, to prevent sales to underage population? I think there have been like different uh, laws that are in place that aim at like um, reducing uh, selling of tobacco and alcohol products to underage including, I think there are some states that do uh, random inspections in terms of like checking whether the retailers uh, real look at their IDs using like proxies for people who like go and purchase. So as like to just ensure like, or to evaluate whether retailers actually check the IDs or not. And there are also like recent laws, uh, including like ID scanning laws that have been implemented in more recent times. So that maybe could have an impact in terms of like reducing underage purchase of tobacco and alcohol products. Yeah. I'm also, uh, you know, not very surprised by the funding um, that in early days when the vertical ID laws were implemented, uh, it was found to be effective. But over time, you know, it has just uh, lost its power, <laughs> its effectiveness. And I'm just wondering, you know, how well, I guess, you know, Justin also mentioned the, the trends, but I feel like, you know, in late 20, uh, 2000s and even now, like there are online sales as well. And yeah. um, the use um, and young uh, young adults, even you know, like you know, right now, we have TC twenty tobacco twenty one laws, but uh, they may still able to get the products from uh, online stores. And uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Um, uh, I currently don't. We didn't look at like um, online sources. Yeah of tobacco, but yeah, I agree. That could be like an interesting avenue to look at yeah. on whether like percentage of youth that get, on whether there have been changes over the decade on in terms of like how youth assess uh, tobacco comparing uh, retail purchases to uh, online purchase of tobacco products. Yeah. So I think if we find a good data set that has that information, that could be a very interesting avenue to look at. And that could also be one of the changes that had taken place over the, over the past one. Yeah, decade. that's right. I know that International Tobacco uh, Control Project um, has a survey that asks about where consumers, including young consumers, purchase their e-cigarettes. But I'm also, I guess I vaguely remember that TOICPS is trying to have some questions 
regarding the retail uh, like stores where uh, people purchase oxygen to self-report where they purchase their products. But I'm not sure, so I have to double check too. But I think maybe TUSDS is a, a, a source. All right, I think I don't see any other questions in the Q&A. Very nice job, Erica. I really enjoyed the paper. So I think it's time to conclude our um, presentation today. Uh, Julia, can you take it over and conclude uh, today's seminar? Thank you. Uh, so, Ju Julia, you are muted. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 130 people for your participation. Have a top-snatch weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs>